Okay, so I think we can start now. So again, our main objective today is to cover the concept of file handling in programming language. Uh, what we mean by, in this session, we're going to talk about what is a file, different types of files. And also sometimes when we write a program, instead of getting the input from a keyboard or any other sources, we can also get the input from a file. So sometimes we can read an input from a file. And also when we get our result after processing, we can also save our result in a file. And normally we use the term read and write. Uh, read a file means we are getting input from the file. Write to a file means we are saving our result in a file. So that's the main uh, topic today, file handling and also applications. So in this chapter, again, we're going to learn about computer files. So we're going to talk about different types of files and also the data higher ranking and performing file operations. Uh, most file operations, the major two operations is the, again, reading from a file or writing to a file. Also, we're going to go through the control break logic and also how to merge files. Uh, hopefully we're going to end somewhere around here and if there's enough time then again we cover the concept of master and also transaction file processing also what is a random access files so first we start with what is a file or understanding computer files so let's go through the definition here here we say a computer file is a collection of data stored on the permanent storage devices, such as computer's hardware, I mean, sorry, computer drive, a hard drive on the cloud, or it can be DVD, uh, floppy disk, flash drive, etc. Uh, so by looking at the definition, we can say again, a computer file is more or less a data that is a store in a computer system or electronically store in a computer system. And this computer system may have a storage device where we can store the data. So the data that can be stored in a computer file can be again test files. And test file can be numbers, names, uh, symbols, salary, again, it can be in English, most test files. And also we have the binary files. Binary files can be images or music. And normally it will be graphic files, which is not yet encoded as a test. And also in computer, again, system, uh, we can say a test file can be readable by S, by the users. A binary files, normally we cannot read it. So uh, binary is 0, 1, 0. So the concept of binary, again, having a data with only two possible digits, which is 0, 1, 0, 1. So it's very difficult for us to read, but normally Computer systems so store normally files in binary form, but the binary form is what we call the machine language. That is the language the computer understands, 0101. Zero, zero, one. So every files have a name. So we will say that a file name is normally a name that we can use to identify a specific file and each file if we store it in the same directory that's in the same location folder, they must have a unique name. Uh, but I can store two files with the same name, but they have to be in different locations or different folder. So example given here, we have a file name January payroll or previous month sales. So again, every computer files must have a file name. And also the computer file may have an extension or the file name extension. The extension will tell us the type of application we can use to open that file. And also what type of file it is. 
So for example, the extension dot TST will be a test file and can be opened by any test editor or a word processing program. Example will be a Microsoft Word, etc. We also have dot DAT, dot DOCX, also dot DOCS. It can be used by used by again, that's the Microsoft Word uh, applications. Uh, for example, we have dot Java. Dot Java means again, it's a Java source files. So every file must have extension. The extension will identify the type of file we have. So here yeah, we said that a specific creation time and modification date. Also, every file have it. So if I create a file, normally if you go to the computer to go and open the file or to even view the file, you see the time the file was modified. Or if it's not modified, then you see the time it was originally created. Uh, for example, if we create a file today, uh, we may have today's date on the file. If we modify it tomorrow, then today's date will be gone. We may have tomorrow as the last date it was modified. So every computer file have a specific creation time and also the modification date. Also, we can know the file size. Normally, the file size is measured in bytes. Uh, the reason why we measure file uh, size in bytes because we know a file consists of characters. Each character have eight bits, and eight bits makes one byte. Uh, that's why if we are going to buy any storage device for a computer system like flash drive or our hard drive, the size of the or uh, if we say that the flash drive size is two gigabytes, it means it can store up to two billion characters or symbols, etc. Because in computer system, every character or symbol is represented by a byte, and a byte means eight bits. So if we have only one character, the size is a byte, which is eight bits. If we have kilobyte, kilo means 1,000. So that means the size of the file is 1,000 bytes, which means they have up to 1,000 uh, characters stored. Same thing applied to megabyte means we have million characters or gigabyte billion characters. And now we are mostly on terabyte. Most of our personal computers, laptop, our hard drive or storage device, somewhere around trillion now, which we call the terabyte. So terabyte means we can stop to a trillion characters. So this would be an uh, example here. Yeah, we say we have stored three, again, this would be a window system. Normally we store files in a folder or a directory. Even if it's a hard drive, most of the time it's good to create a folder then you store it. But again, we can store it straight forward. So for example, here we have three files. These three files are stored in a folder. The folder, you can see the, again, the folder name, very small, but again, it has a folder name. And also we can see the date, the file, either the date the file was created or was last modified. Also, we can see the type of file and also the size, etc. So, so how do we organize files? Uh, very simple example, let's say I'm teaching four classes. Uh, I don't want to save all my four classes, lectures, assignments, uh, exams, everything in one folder, which means I may have a lot of files in one folder, which sometimes is difficult to look for a specific file, or not difficult, but it will take time. So in this case, we can organize our files. So we organize our file by using as much folders as we need. So if I'm teaching four classes, I will start with four folders for each class. Now inside each class folder, I may create another folder for lectures, another folder for assignment, and this, in this way, basically, I'm organizing my files, which will be very easy to access 
and also easy to locate the files. Also, we should know the path. The path is uh, where the file is saved. So combination of the disk drive plus the complete hierarchy of directory. So for example, here we have a payroll data. This is a file, but this file is stored in a, a folder named sample files. The sample files folder also is stored in a, a folder named logic. And logic folder is stored in a, our hard drive, which is the C drive. So that's why we say it's a complete hierarchy of directories. The higher is the C drive. From there, we go to the logic, sample files for that before we get to the actual file, which is the payroll data. So again, the best way to organize a file is always using directories and folders. And by doing that also, we can create the path. So this is a data higher ranking. A data higher ranking, basically, again, the concept of higher ranking means we are starting either from the lowest to highest or the highest to lowest. Uh, so data higher ranking would describe the relationship between data components, which consists of characters. So characters will be the lowest unit or the lowest uh, form of the data higher ranking because characters can be a single letter, uh, it can be a, a digit, or it can be a symbol. Now, when we join two or more characters, we can have a field. So the fields will be data item representing a single attribute of a record. Now, in order to get a record, we have to get maybe two or more fields that can make a record. Now, when we have a record, then all the records together become a files. This is the concept of database system. So let's use an example. Let's say we have a, a database system which consists of student tables. The student table normally consists of, of course, students' information. So a single character will be the student last name, one digit from the last name. Let's say the last name is James. So J is a single character. That's the lowest unit of a data. Now, when we combine all the character J, A, M, E, S, we get a field. So the fields will be the last name, the first name, the address, each is a field. So that's why we say the single attribute of a record. Or we can also use the term, the single characteristics of an entity. The entity can be either a person or an inventory product, etc. Now, if I have the last name, first name, uh, address, etc., that will represent a record. And since we have more than one student, then we may have records, group of fields that go together for the same logical reason. I have 10 students, they are all students, or 10 persons and they are all students. Now, if I store all these students in my class in a, one location, that is called a file. So files will be the group of related records. In this case, they are all students, they are related then we're going to store it again in a database system. So database system normally holds the related files, data in tables. So again, the concept of data hierarchy will take us back to uh, the basic concept of database management system from characters all the way to the table. So that's the diagram here to show us the concept of the data hierarchy. Uh, we can see one single character, let's say Y or any character. Then to have at least one field, in this case can be first name or last name. So if my name is Denise, one character D, will be the lowest unit, which is a character. 
then the combination of all the six characters becomes a field. Then everything on one row become a record. So here the record have six fields. Then if we have more than one record, which is right here, then we get what we call a file or in database system, we will call it a table. So this table consists of four records and the records consists of one, two, three. the record consists of six fields and each fields have its number of characters. So I'm going to wait for a few seconds if any questions so far. So again, this section of the chapter, we are learning about computer file systems. Also, they are higher rankings. And we may talk about some computer applications also. Okay, so right now we went through what is a file, uh, the characteristics of them, and some few definitions. Now, this is more or less a computer programming course. So we can do some file operations. When we have a file, there are so many operations we can do. And we are starting with the most important. In most programming language, when I want to use a file system, like in Java or C++, we have to create what we call the file handler. Uh, yeah, they say declare file identifier, but we normally use the term also file handler. Now, when I create a file handler, that's what I'm going to use to do all the file operations. Anytime I refer to a file operation, I'm going to use it. So for example, if I want to get an input from a file, the first thing I need to do is to check the computer system if the file exists. So I can write a con like a if condition saying that if the, the file exists, then the next step is to open it. If the file is not existing, then we can throw what we call the exception handling. I will throw the exception handling. So that's the file operation to use data files in your program. First, we declare the file handler. So we have the input file name, employee data, and also the output file will be named update, updated data. Uh, so again, anytime we want to do a file operation in computer programming, as we said, if you want to get an input, the first thing you do is to open the file. So you can see that here we are using the command open and the file name is employee data dot dat, but we are using what the file handler. So open employee data, employee data dot file. So open will be a command. Again, depends on in, in Python we use the term open. Also Java use uh, Java also have a command open. Uh, the file handler you have to create the more or less like an object. You you have to create it. In this case, we create it here. So anything we want to do, we have to refer to the file handler. So when I open the file now, I have an option to read name from the employee data, also input address from employee data, also the input pay rate from employee. So input or reading from a file means I'm getting the data from the file. So instead of using the keyboard, tell the user to type the data. This time we are going to open the file and then we get the, we read from the file, which means we get the input from the file. Most important is that the, the, the way the file is stored, the data is stored in the file. You have to be very in order here. So we may have the name first, the address, the pay rate. The same thing if we are writing to a file, if I want to save it, I have to make sure I save it very, I should be very careful with the order I save it, the fields. So name, address, pay rate are the fields. They have to be saved in the order. I'm, um, most likely we're going to see an example of a Java program using file system. 
So again, these are the beginning file operations. The first thing, how to get input from a file. First, we have to create our file identifier, but again, you can also call, use the term file handler. Then we have to, of course, open the file. If I want to use the file, I have to open it first. Then in this case, this case, I'm reading from a file, which means I'm getting the input from the file. So the input I'm getting here is the employee name, address, and the pay rate. So here we say programming language have a different ways of determining how much data to input. That's how much data we have to get from the file. So again, it depends on the language you are using. And also sometimes we can use what we call the delimiter. Delimiter is more or less like a, a signal to do something. So for example, if I'm using a comma and I'm reading from a file, I have three fields. If I don't see a comma, let's say if I have a name James William, there's no comma, but I have a last name and first name because there was no delimiter like a comma or semicolon or tab, maybe all together or something. I didn't specify it. The whole other name, James Miller will go to first name instead of only James to go to the first name, Miller to go to the last name. So we always have to have the delimiter so that when you read, when we are reading the first file or the first data into a, a variable in our program because we are going to get the input from the file we have to store it somewhere in our program to use it so in this case and the variable should take only one value at a time so we have to specify whether a tab so if the reading process we see a space then it will move to the next variable if there's a space it will move to the next variable so again, many languages, we always have to use a delimiter such as comma, can be semicolon or tab character, which can store between the data fields. But if you don't have no delimiter, then all the data will go to only one variable. So it will be like everything is one field. Like James Miller is one field. Instead of two feet, James is last name, Miller is the first name. So I think this diagram is very nice one to explain now. So if I write a program and this is my file system, you can see the files I have. This is like a, a record, four records. We have Matthews, 47, Maple, then $17, the pay rate. So we can see that this is only three fields. If I'm using comma as a delimiter, now, if I'm using space as, as a delimiter, I may have a problem because Matthew, 47 will be like a one field. Uh, we cannot have a name 47 yeah, or comma. So by looking at this file, I know the comma is the delimiter. So first we get Matthew into a variable name. Let's say we name it name, or in this case, name field. Then we have a comma delimiter. So that means 47. We don't have no comma after 47. So 47 and maple together, they will go to one variable, let's say address. Then we see a comma again, we jump to the next variable. And this will be $17.00. So $17 will go to another variable. So in this case, we're going to have three variables that will store the name, the address, and the pay rate. And this is getting the input. So this is how our again our computer system look like. And our hard drive is like a circular system. So, and also the hard drive is the storage device consists of what we call the cells. Each cell have a unique address, more or less like a boxes as we can see, and this section we don't need to worry the computer the operating system does everything for us so when we declare variable or when we get a data operating system will allocate the memory space and the locations also and the data will be stored there but this is how our data is stored in the computer 
and actually in a real sense it's not 47 mapo 47 mapo is readable by s the computer system will not understand 47 mapo so 47 mapo will be in a binary number system uh, 010101 also remember we said every digit or character or a symbol is a byte so which means if four we have eight bits which is zero uh, zero one zero one up to eight the pattern will tell whether it's four or seven so for example if it's one it's easy which means it's zero 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 one we have seven zeros and one each character as i said uh, the digit symbol must have eight bits so eight bits represent one byte and one byte can be one single character digit or symbol now when we are performing file op operations also we can do what is called a sequential file and the keyword is sequential which means something have to be in sequence uh, we have the random access files, which means we can access the data in the file at any location randomly. Sequential means we have to begin from start. So we have sequential file. Here yeah, they say the program reads all the records in this file from beginning to the end. So most computer system, the file system are not sequential because sequential will not work very well sometimes. If I want to do some operation and my file is at the end, that means I have to start from beginning all the way to the end. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of uh, waste of time. Computer system, our main goal is two things. Uh, come up with applications that are very fast to access or to process or performance very fast. And secondly, you don't want to use too much memory. You want to less the memory because those are the two major computer resources. So sequential file again is the old in days. Today, very rare that an application will use a sequential file system. But again, sequential file system means we read from beginning to the end. Then also we can perform a sorting operations in a, a file. Uh, we know we have two types of sorting, either ascending order or descending order. Descending order means from the lower, uh, from the highest to lowest. Ascending order means from the high, uh, from the lowest to highest. Uh, there are so many beautiful, uh, I mean, something if you learn, you really enjoy it. The sorting algorithms, we have so many of them. All the sorting algorithm is based on one thing, performance, how fast it sorts the data. Uh, for example, we have a sorting algorithm called insection sort, uh, radi sort bubble sorting bubble sorting is one of the worst uh, it takes it almost compare almost everything and it takes time uh, again we, you you may study this more when you take data structure and algorithm course uh, where you learn more algorithms so yeah for now we should know that there are two types of sorting either send the other descend the other of course if we have a file we can sort items on it we can access item from beginning to the end, or we can do random access. We can access at any position of the file. Next is writing data to a file. So those are the, when you are writing program, those are the two major things, as I said earlier, or the two major file operations we always do. Uh, it, it, when you start to do file system, you really enjoy programming because it, it's kind of like a real world scenarios now because in a real world i don't think we may write a program and tell a user to enter the data we don't use only one or two values if that is the case it can be used a calculator or a person can do it but we know computer system can process millions of millions of data i can have a millions employee and i can find their pay within a seconds a computer can do that within seconds uh, calculate over thousands of employees salary in less than a minute let's say but if i have to do that maybe i mean if not weeks maybe it, it, it will take months or a lot of hours uh, to find uh, to calculate 
one million employee salary using calculator. Uh, it, uh, it, this will take months. By computer, it won't even take a, an hour or a day to do it. But it will take longer if only the computer cannot get the data faster. So that's the question mark here. It will work. Computer can process it within a second. But if the data is not there, then the computer can't do anything. So this is the idea of, again, using the file system. So this, this means in our file system, we already have millions of employees already. So all, the, all we have to do now, the computer will access the data, process it very quick. So the two major operations against reading. Reading means we get the data from the file, process it, it then we store it, then we write. Normally when we write a program, we are going to have two different files. Uh, where the input files are, where the output files or the result will go to, we can make that separately so that we know we have a set. Because if you get the input and you do everything finish and you put the result back there, uh, most likely you are going to modify it, which means the inputs may not be the same. The original file will not be the same at, as it was before. So it's very good idea to have a separate uh, file that you are going to store the result. Now, when you do your processing, everything finish, we are going to close the file. Uh, most of the time, that's the last, <laughs> excuse me, that's the last task we do. I write a program to find the sum of two numbers. I get the two numbers from a file. And then when I process finish, I get the result. I'll put the result in another file or the same file, doesn't matter. Then when I finish everything, I have to close it. Beginning, you have to open, do all the work, finish, then you have to close it. So yeah, they say when you finish using a file, the program should close the file. So using Java or C++, I may write instruction or command to close the file. You have to write it because Computer program normally is a statement that tell the computer hardware what to do. So if I don't write the code to close the program, then the, the, the file will not close. As if I don't write a code to close the file. Normally the default input and output devices is always the keyboard and monitor. And actually we will, last week we even ran one or two Java program what are we using to get the input? It's a keyboard. Or even if we are not using the keyboard, we can just assign, use the assignment operator, assign only one value. Again, as I said, in the real world, you want to process millions or thousands of customers' data or employee. Uh, you can't use a keyboard to enter one at a time, but that would take a long time. Now, a program that performs file of operations, uh, you also have the backup file. A backup file is important, I would say just in case. So uh, normally if I have my file and I save a file and I know it's very important, I can make a copy into another storage device and keep it separately. Or I may have my file in my hard drive, then I may make a copy of that file in my flash drive and keep it sep separate separately for backup. So a backup file normally is a copy of a file that you already have. So here we say copy kept in case values need to be restored to the original state. And the backup copy is called a parent file. Then the new reverse copy is called a child file. So this is a program that performs a file operation. Again, we will, hopefully we will see the Java example program about this concept. But here, let's flow with the, the flow chart. Let's use the flow chart here. So here we have a declaration. As we said earlier, the first thing we need is the file identifier, or we also call the file handler. So you can see I have two of them. One is for the input file where I will get the input data where I'm going to read. Then the other is the output file. After I process finish the file that I'm going to save. So anytime I want to save a file, then I'm going to use the output file handler 
or identifier. And the name is called update data. And the input file is called employee data. Now here we declare some few uh, variable y because when we get the input from the file, as we said earlier, we need to store it somewhere. We need to keep it somewhere. So we saw the example of this employee data. It has uh, three fields. It has the name, the address, and the pay rate. So we declare those three variables. Because when we get the input from the file, we're going to, and also the delimiter will be a comma. Then also we have a variable named race, but this is a constant variable, $2 or 2.00. So the first thing we do is to call the housekeeping function. Housekeeping function will be like the instructions, etc. So we have it here. And so the housekeeping function will tell us the first thing, of course, we are doing the file operation. So the first thing we have to do is to open the file. So here we say open employee data. So this means we are opening the input file. Employee data, because employee data is the input file handler. And the file, the input file, original, the original file name is employee data.dat. Remember the name always have to have extension. Extension is a period with some characters. So first again, we open the input file. Then we also open the output file. So we open the two files. Now we have our variable name, pay rate from uh, employee date, the data employee data, which is again our identifier, the input file. So we want to get the input. The, those are the three variables we want to get. The input, uh, the input will be the name, the address, and the pay rate. And that comes from the employee data. So that's the how the so the housekeeping function, what it does is to open the two files and also specify the variables that we are going to store the data at. So here we said there's a condition that not end of a file. Uh, EOF is used a lot. I think Java don't use it, but I quite remember C and C++, so they use it. So if I have a while loop and I say, why not EOF? It means why we, are not, we haven't read the end of the file. Because when we, re we reach the end of the file, we have to stop. So when I open the file and I want to get the input from the file, since I'm getting more than one input, I will use the loop. I will use the loop. Then the loop will terminate when I reach the end of the file. So that's why we use not end of the file. So if it's not end of the file, which means what? We have to be inside the loop to read the data. So detail, detail loop. What detail loop does is here, it's going to read the data. So detail loop, uh, we get pay rate equal to pay rate plus the race. Then the output name, and the output file, we have the name, address, and pay rate, same thing, to update date. Then we have the input, also the name, address, pay rate from the employee data. So that's the process we are going to do with the detail loop until we reach the end of the file. So when we read down the file, uh, end of the file, we can't do any process no more. And we come out of the program. So we have a finish method to finish, then we stop. So what the finish method does is to close both files. It's to close. So it's very in, in order. And we will see Java. Almost every programming, the file operation is that first thing you check if the file exists, very important, because if the file doesn't exist, then you have error, the program will stop. So normally we can create what we call the exceptional ending inside the 
to check if the file exists or not. Exceptional handle allow us to throw errors away and continue executing. So that's what they should do. So if the file exists, then we do all the work. So again, EOF stands for end of a file. If we haven't reached the end of the file, then we keep processing. When we reach the end of the file, then we stop. So the same apply here, we have the pseudocode. Again, we have the declaration of the file handlers, the input file, the output file, very important. And also you have to look at the content of the file to know how many variables you need. In this our file, we need three variables because the file is like a record with uh, employees, name, address, and pay rate. Also, in case there's a raise, we double the rate. So we do the half skipping again. Then we check why not end of the file. Then we call the detail loop to process what, what we are doing. Then we end it. So again, half skipping means the first thing we have to do about file system is to open the file. So we open the two files, the employee data, which is the input file, and also updated data, which is the, the, the output. So we get the input from the employee data file. The input will go to name, address, and pay rate. Then we know pay rate also if it's promoted, pay rate will be pay rate plus raise, uh, raised by two dollars. We can change it to double raise by multiply by raise because raise is two. So if I multiply the rate by two, it means I double the income. So after we finish, we output our result to again this time the output will not be on the screen so we have to output it output it to the output file which is called the updated data then when we finish everything we cross both files the input and output files we close both of them So next is understanding the control break logic. I'm going to wait for a few seconds if we have any question. Okay. So that today I'm using my camera because I was able to repair my computer, take it to technician last week. So my camera is okay now. I know camera is very important to know the person behind the camera, uh, behind the lectures. So hopefully the camera will be on to the end of the semester. So again, next is understanding the control break logic. Uh, and also, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I'm not sure. Oh, well, let's see if we finish today. I would like to go through, again, we have like three weeks, uh, less than four weeks. Uh, I'll say roughly four weeks. After this week, three weeks for the semester to end. So please. Uh, you know, I've been saying this many times, uh, but I will say it again. You have to do the assignment. You have to. If you have a late assignment, please submit it for a credit. Uh, very poor. If you have a question about the assignment, again, you can send an email. If I have to make a small vi a video about the assignment, or if you have a time, or you can go to the, the school also have a tutorial online. So you can also take the assignment there, the tutor may explain to you, or we can schedule a time, we can do it online uh, with a Zoom, or we can do it by email if our time doesn't, uh, if we don't have the same time schedule, because I know some, most of you are working and going to school at the same time. So if the schedule doesn't work, uh, we can do it by email or by phone very quick also. So please do your best to submit the assignment. Okay, so let's keep going. Understanding the control break logic. 
Here they say a control break is a temporary detour in the logic of a program. Uh, we use control break a lot when we are doing looping. So for example, I can do a loop that I'm finding, I want to do something 20 times, but I may have a condition that when I reach five, I want to break, which means the loop will stop. Instead of going to 20, I use break to stop it. Or I may have some condition and I'm so okay, if this condition is true, we have to break, which means we have to stop. We use this a lot also in switch statements in Java language. Uh, also, the same concept. Here. Also, we have what we call continue. Continue means, for example, if I'm in a loop and I have to do something 20 times, but I don't want to do the number five. So I will say that if the loop reach number five, it should continue, which means we are going to skip. So you see that two keywords a lot in many computer programming language. Uh, break means you stop. Uh, you stop what you are doing, then continue. Uh, continue means you skip. If that condition is true, you skip it, then you continue. So here we say control break programs uses a change in a value to initiate a special actions or processing. Maybe to change the whole again. And also a control break report groups similar data together. Uh, input records must be in sequential order. And this is again a temporary detour in the logic of a program. So here we have a control break report with totals after each state. So here we let's say we have a company. Now you can see what we did here. We group all together based on their state. So all Alabama together, we have three. Alaska together, we have five. Arizona together, we have one. So here we're going to have a total for each, for each state. So another examples of a control break reports. Here, let's say we have all employees listed in order by department number. And the one example we saw, all the customers are listed together by state. Or we also can say all books for sale in a bookstore are listed by category or maybe by the subject or topic or all items sold in order by date of sale. So we have everything by date of sale in a database system. We also have what we call the single level control break. Uh, this would be a data based on the value of a single variable and also uses a control break field to all the previous value. So a single level a data based on the value of only single variable. So uh, we may see an example here. Maybe we can go through this look very small. But again, the whole concept is we can, we can arrange items in grouping based on some category that we, we're going to choose. So for example, here we have an input file. Uh, we request a few variables, name, city, state, and also the count. So we get ready, we call the get ready method. A get ready method basically we get the output. Here the output will be a title. And then the output handler we have a column heads, then the output file, then also the input variables name, city, state. Uh, name city state will come from the in file, that's the input file. So we have get ready. While we haven't reached the end of the file, we produce our report. So the report section is where we are going to again arrange things in the order based on the report, whether based on the state. In this case, we have a company clients by state of residence. So we can arrange it by state.
and this is the produce report. So the produce report is based on state. We say the state not equal to the old state and not equal. Again, we have less than greater than, so not equal to the old state. If it's yes, then we control break. We call the control break. So if it's not equal, that means we are going to include. So here we say count for all states, then we count it. Then we initialize the counter to zero and assign the state to all state. If it's no, which means the state equal to the whole state, then we just output it and we count and we increment it. So whatever the whole state is, the category we are using. Uh, if it's not, uh, the state is not the whole state, then we don't count it. Uh, we, we say the output, we should output count for all state and we show the count we initialize. And to finish up again, we output count for the whole state, how many we have, then we close the file. Again, we may see this more detail when we will do Java example of a Java program. Uh, so the next is we can also emerge files. So you imagine sequential files. Uh, merging means you're combining something. So the concept of merging files means combining two or more files <clears throat> while maintaining the sequential order or the records. So sequential files means the items inside the file must be in order, very important. So even we are merging two files together, we are going to maintain the order of it also. So example here given can be a, a file of current employees in ID number order. So we put, maybe we have two different files with uh, the employees from different departments. We want to merge them. We merge them together, but we put them in order based on employee ID in sequential order. Or a file of a parts manufactured in the North Start factory in part number order. And also a file of a parts manufactured in South Start factory also in a part number order. So the, the, again, the main concept of merging files is to combine them. Uh, sequential files always, uh, they must be in order. So here the two conditions required for merging files, each file must has the same record layout, uh, which means their fields, everything must be the same. And of course they have to be the same application, let's say Microsoft Word or Excel, the same program. Then also secondly, this is sequential file, so it must be sorted in the same order based on the same field. So for example, very difficult that we can, which we can do. You cannot merge two different files from two different applications. Let's say I have Microsoft Word. I want to merge Microsoft Word document with Microsoft Access document or Excel. No, it doesn't work. So the layout must be the same, two test files or two Microsoft Word files, fine. Uh, if we are dealing with sequential files, then we have to put them in order based on some particular field. So this is example they gave us. Uh, we can see first of all, we have his name, his balance, then West name, West balance. At least we have the same number of attributes and the same data type and it's the same file. So when we merge it together, we get what is on the left side. Now we are merging and by putting it in order using the name. So we can see able come brown instead of D, C come first. So we have chain before D, E, F, etc. So here we are merging a sequential files. First, the files has to be the same type. The layout must be the same, the number of fields, everything. And secondly, since it's sequential, we have to sort it based on one particular field. So here we say the main line logic is similar to other file processing programs, except for handling two files. So with two input files, 
we must determine when both files are at the end of the file, if you are using two files. Because again, when you are reading from a file, you have to read the end. So we always have to signal. So here we need to define a flag variable to indicate both files have reached the end of the file. And also we must define two input files and read one record from each input file also. So merging sequential file, we can see a, a flow chart. So declaration here, we have our two files, input file for east file, another input file for west file. And these are the two files we want to merge. When we merge it, finish, it, it becomes an output file. So most of the time, the program, we need to create the file already because when we merge the file and we output it, uh, the file must exist before we put something inside. So that's why we have declaration for output file, name the merge file. Then again, we're going to have our first name because each input file or each file have three variables, the, the name, and also the balance, sorry, it's two, name and a balance. But we have east file have east name and east balance. West file have west name and west balance. Then here we are using a special signal, which is ZZZZZ. This signal will indicate the end of the file. So the string end name. So after our declaration finish, we get ready. Get ready means we're going to open the files. Uh, so uh, let's go to the get ready function, maybe to be in the next slides. But again, the get ready section, we're going to, is the same as the previous get ready. We open the files and we start to get the input. Then we process it now. So we have the while loop now to again, uh, both at end, whether we reach the end is why if not uh, uh, if no then we finish yes and uh, not uh, both at end uh, which means both files reach the end not yes uh, yeah we have a signal why so if this condition is yet true then we merge the records. We call the method to merge it. Otherwise, if it's no, that means we reach the end of the file. Then we finish. So again, this is our get ready and also read east. Again, we may go through these small details uh, when we start to, again, go through the Java code. So here we can see the merge record. East name, less than West name. Uh, so there's concept of, again, sorting. And we also have what we call the master and transaction file process. So here we say some related files have a master transaction relationship. Uh, this concept normally cover an operating system also. So the master file normally will host the complete and relative permanent data. Transaction, because it's a transaction file, contains temporary data. And always, if there's a new transaction, it's going to be updated. So when the transaction file is updated, that will update the master file. So update the master file, changes the values in its field based on transactions. And most databases have this concept also. So you may have a master file, transaction file in the system. Master file is like a permanent data that we hold it uh, for the record for, uh, it doesn't change, it only change 
when we do a transaction. So for example, a company may have a system that we have our data warehouse. Data warehouse will be like a master file. And every Saturday, we are going to update it. So all the transaction the company do from Sunday to Friday is in the transaction file. They will be updating every time customer comes, buying or selling, etc. And then by Sunday, the final transaction file, oh, sorry, Saturday, will be sent to the master file, which is the data warehouse. Then the following working day, let's say the work day starts on Sunday, then we will start with the new transactions. So example given here, a library maintains a master file. A library system will maintain a master file of all the patrons and also transaction with information by each book and other items checkout. Or a college also may maintain a master file for all students and a transaction file for each course registration. Or a telephone company maintains a master file of all the telephone line numbers and also transaction file with information about every call. So this would be a master file, a library maintain a master file for all the patrons. People use the library and also the transaction they did about each book. But the transaction file will be a particular day when the library is doing its operation, how many customers or how many patrons bring in book, check out or check in the books. That will be a, a specific transaction for a specific day. But the master file will be, oh, let's say if the company, uh, the library start operating maybe 10 years ago, it can contain all the information, data about all the patrons, all the transactions they have done about each book since the, the database or the master file was created. We may also have updating approaches, as we said earlier, where, uh, when we do transaction finish, we need to, we get a new information now. We need to update it in the master file. So change information in master file or copy master file and change new version. Uh, we have an example for it. Again, we will go through this later on. It seems like time is going on S. Uh, when we get to the lab work, again, we're going to run some of this code. So I want us to go through the random access file, which is the last section. So we already know sequential access file means everything starts from beginning. You want to access something in the end, you still have to start from beginning to you reach the end. So this is the best, more efficient and more better way of accessing the system. And random access files means we can access the files at any lo location in the file. And we use the term also batch processing. This is involved performing the same tasks with many records, one after the other. Also using, using a sequential files, random access file can use. An example also a red time applications that require a record be accessed immediately while client is waiting. Uh, red time application, you don't want to use a sequential file because in this case, the client is waiting and you don't want to start from beginning to you. So you can just a uh, real time applications. We can randomly access the file in any location. Also interactive program, random access is better because of the speedness. So a program which the user makes the direct request. Uh, so you have to be faster. And the difference of the two is that sequential files is very slow because everything starts from beginning. Random access, you can randomly access any files in any location. So we say the random access files, records can be physically located in any order, as we said earlier. So in any order, sequential, you have to start from beginning. So instance access files, yeah, we say files in which record must be accessed immediately also known as direct access files.
So this is the difference between the two. I want to access the fifth data in sequential order. I have to start from beginning, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, before I reach the fifth. This takes time. But with random access, we can just access the target straight. Uh, so this is more faster. So accessing a record in sequential file and also in random access file, the difference again is how fast. Sequential is very slow. Sequential, you are, uh, you will be in the same speed with random. If luckily the file that we want to access is the first file, the beginning, because always you start from beginning. That's when both speed can be the same. So in summary, in, in this session, again, this session, we didn't go detail by the, uh, the program yet. Again, this is just to get the lectures together. Uh, so here we learn at least what is a computer file. Uh, we talk about data higher ranking uh, from simple character all the way to a database system. Then we talk about two different types of data files, uh, access both sequential and and also random access. We also talk about the file operation. I think that's the most important in a, in a programming language. Uh, the major two tasks will be, again, either getting an input from file, which we call read, or storing data in a file, which we call write to a file. And anytime you are doing any operation on a file, you have to write a code to open the file. And mostly we need, we need what is called the file handler to do it. And when I finish, I have to close the file. So again, hopefully next lectures, uh, which will be this Wednesday, we are going to see some few Java code on file system, uh, at least one or two examples. And also we haven't run a code yet on the array we didn't get a chance last week Wednesday to do it. So this Wednesday will be mostly lab work, uh, which we're going to go through some array and also file and list system using Java language. So in the question before we leave, some stand now. No questions. No question, okay. So, Again, Wednesday will be our lab work. And also, we should try our best uh, to do the homework assignment. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to do now is to stop the recording. Then I will call the attendance again.